Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to UNICEF Global's Mission Idea Contest Lecture Series. Today, Professor Koizumi will give our third lecture in a series of five lectures to assist you with your mission design ideas for MIG-7. Again, the lecture will run for approximately 60 minutes, but this time it will cover deep space exploration and micro propulsion. And if you are planning on submitting an abstract, you will need to select a propulsion system. So pay attention. For this lecture, we ask that short comments and questions can be please posted to the link that we will list in chat. And for long questions, please use the chat function instead. A Q&A period of approximately 15 minutes will be held after the lecture, followed by a group photograph, an update to the MIG-7 requirements, and details about the upcoming lectures. And with that, I would like to introduce our lecturer to you. Hiroyuki Kazumi is an associate professor in the Department of Advanced Energy and Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the University of Tokyo, Japan, where he directs the Space Propulsion Laboratory and leads the developments of micropropulsion systems for microsatellites, Hadoyoshi 4, Procyon, AQTD, and Equilius. In 2020, he started working as CTO at the space propulsion startup, Pale Blue Incorporated, that was founded by him and engineers who got PhDs at his lab. Previously, Hiroyuki Kazumi served as an assistant professor in the Institute of Space and Astronautical Science at JAXA from 2007 to 2011, where he was involved in the Hayabusa 1 project and he was responsible for the operation of the ion engines MU10 and the retrieval of the Hayabusa capsule at Woomera in Australia. He received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Keio University and a master and PhD degree in aeronautics and astronautics from the University of Tokyo. He was awarded the International Electric Propulsion Conference Best Paper Award 2015 and prizes for science and technology, the commendation for science and technology by the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology 2017. So please join me in thanking and welcoming Professor Koizumi for his lecture. And Professor, you can commence your lecture now. Hey, thank you for the introduction. And are you hearing me, Nate? You're welcome. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, so please wait a little bit. So I have started sharing my presentation. So, ah, please wait a little bit. Okay, okay, I see. So do you see my presentation on first title page? Yes, we do, it's clear. Okay, so I'll start it. Okay, so hi everyone, uh, good evening. So today I wanna talk about the micropropulsion, especially for the usage to for deep space exploration. And uh, okay, so let's start. So wait, okay. So uh, before moving to the main content, uh, I wanna give you several general informations. So first one, uh, in this lecture, uh, I wanna try to use uh, this software, comment screen. So by using this, uh, software uh, or application, uh, you can share your comment, impression, questions uh, with everybody or in, among audience. So please use this QR code or this uh, direct link. So please wait, I will uh, paste this link to the Zoom chat. Ah, already Nate has posted. So let's see the Zoom chat. Uh, so please check this direct link or this QR code. So by entering this page, uh, you can uh, insert your comment or question, any feeling or impressions. So mm, any comment uh, can be shared with everyone. Uh, thank you for clapping. <laughs> so the reason of this software is uh, I want to uh, Mm, reflection from the audience. So this is online meeting. So I cannot see your face. So uh, I want any kind of reflect, um, uh, reflection from you. So I introduced this comment screen. So please utilize uh, this comment screen freely. And also, uh, yeah, I want to introduce several textbooks. 
uh, which is to be convenient to run propulsion systems. First one is a rocket propulsion element. This is very famous, popular, and classical book. So it's a very classical book. However, uh, they update, uh, frequently they updated their versions. So currently ninth edition, so classical book, but not an old book. So the information is latest. So it's very nice book. So, but the uh, <laughs> price is also very nice. So uh, very expensive, but uh, yeah, it's uh, worthwhile to buy. So uh, first one, this one. And the second one is also about uh, space propulsion. And uh, the content is similar with the previous one, rocket propulsion elements. But uh, here, the content is uh, a little bit compact, uh, short. And mainly, this is for chemical propulsion. And if you want to learn the elective propulsion, uh, this is a very standard book, Physics of Elective Propulsion. However, this is actually old book. And uh, maybe 40 years ago. So physics, its description is very good, very good expression, uh, description about physics. However, as to the technology is somehow old. And uh, if you want to get the newest, latest information about elective propulsion, this book would be better. Uh, fundamentals of electric propulsion. Although the focus of this book is uh, on uh, ion thruster and holotech thruster. So in electric propulsion, there are a lot of thrusters and the ion and holotech thrusters are uh, just uh, two thrusters among those uh, many thrusters. However, this is a major thruster, currently major thruster. So it would be uh, convenient to run the latest technology of electric propulsion. Okay, uh, let's start uh, my lecture. So do you have any comment or questions? Can I start? So uh, today's my lecture. Uh, I have four parts, four chapters, uh, starting from the fundamentals and I move to the chemical propulsion, additive propulsion, and finally, I'll talk about micro propulsion. Okay. So let's start from the fundamental. So let's see this move. So this is a point like a point. So the satellite motion is like this. So I think this uh, motion is a very good example to imagine satellite motion. And the very important point is first, time has an initial velocity by this thing. And also gravitational force. Due to that, point trajectory is bending. And this kind of a circular trajectory. And also, maybe the most importantly, in this movie, there is a frictional force with a fluent. Then, point trajectory is decayed, 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 and the circle becomes smaller, 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 and finally form. However, in the actual space, there is no this kind of frictional force, and then there is no other any force other than gravitational force. Then, satellite trajectory will not be decay. Okay. So satellite can continue to fly, to move. So this is a very important point. Without anything, satellite can fly, can uh, continue the motion, its motion, if there is no obstacle. So it means, uh, so sometimes we use propulsion system, but uh, it is not to move the satellite. Satellite motion is naturally continuing. So the uh, role of propulsion is a different uh, point. And also uh, from this uh, satellite motion, important second point is here. So by the initial velocity and the position, trajectory is different. If you have large velocity, initial velocity, the trajectory becomes larger and larger. And uh, if your initial velocity is smaller, uh, the trajectory becomes smaller. So this is a very essential but important feature of the trajectory. So as I said, in space, if there is no obstacle, there's no mm, frictional force and no other force other than gravitational force, satellites continue to fly. And the role of propulsion system is to change the velocity and to change the trajectory. So for example, from this circular orbit to another ellipse orbit. And for this, 
what we need is a velocity increment. By changing the initial velocity, we can change the trajectory. So in that sense, important point, important index for propulsion system is a velocity increment. Sometimes we say delta V simply. So this delta V is a uh, index for propulsion system. So distance and motion itself is not by propulsion system. The role of propulsion system is to change the velocity. Okay, so let's change the velocity. However, how? On the ground, it's very easy. When you run on the ground, your foot is pushing the ground. This is the mechanism of acceleration. Push something. In water, uh, you will push water. And in air, for example, airplane, it push air. However, unfortunately in space, nothing around you. So nothing to push. So you need to bring something to push and throwing it outside, then getting acceleration. So this mechanism, this acceleration process, it's called as rocket propulsion. So the rocket, the term of rocket, does not mean huge, long launch vehicle. It's just a vehicle. It's an acceleration method, procedure. It's called as a rocket. Okay. So in space, usually we need to use rocket propulsion for the acceleration. So this slide shows a uh, principle of rocket propulsion by ejecting in this case, yeah, this delta M, uh, we can get reaction force, we can get thrust. So uh, from by the, uh, by the uh, momentum conservation, uh, immediately you can find the impulse which will get, uh, which the spacecraft will get is equal to delta M, ejected mass times its velocity U. So this equation. And also from this equation, you will know the thrust will be ejected mass per unit time times exhaust velocity. So this is a fundamental relation for rocket propulsion system. Thrust is a mass flow rate, mass flow rate is M dot uh, times exhaust velocity U. And also when you actually accelerate a spacecraft, you have to uh, take into account the mass reduction of the spacecraft. When you throw out a lot of mass to outside, your spacecraft, its mass will be reduced gradually. So you need to uh, consider that effect. And uh, building the differential equation and solving that, you will get this equation famous rocket equation. So this equation, so uh, here the two equations, this is uh, just an alternative form. This equation describes the relation between delta V acceleration, velocity increment, exhaust velocity U, and MY is the initial mass of the spacecraft. And MF is the final mass of the spacecraft. So very simple, but very effective uh, equation. And here also MR is a mass ratio, uh, MI by MR. So feature of this equation is, uh, yeah, so let's see the second equation. MP is a propellant mass, uh, difference from the initial and the final mass. Here, if you increase the delta V, velocity increment, why if you decrease the exhaust velocity, needed propellant is exponentially increased you need a lot of propellant. Propellant is a mass which should be ejected for the acceleration. So this is a feature of the rocket equation. And in this slide, I, I draw this equation on the graph. So here you see velocity increment, delta V, horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is a mass ratio. But uh, yeah, this is log scale. And uh, there are several colors. This is by uh, exhaust velocities. So if you wanna get uh, 10 kilometers per second by using four kilometers per second exhaust velocity, mass ratio would become higher than 10. 
But instead, if you use a 30 kilometers per second very fast exhaust velocity, mass ratio is lower than two. Yeah, this is two. So you need the effect of exhaust velocity. By increasing the exhaust velocity, mass ratio is drastically reduced. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, this was a rocket equation. And the next point is how to throw the mass outside. That system, that procedure is a propulsion. And in the point of energy, this propulsion system is energy converter. So by using a certain type of energy, finally we convert it from uh, to the kinetic energy. Any kind of energy to kinetic energy. In this point, uh, recently, in these days, there are two major propulsion systems. First one is the chemical propulsion, and the next one is the electric propulsion. The difference is the energy source, chemical energy or electrical energy. So uh, today's lecture, uh, chapter two and chapter three, I'll uh, explain uh, details of these propulsion systems, chemical and electric propulsion. Okay, uh, next point is uh, about the thrust. Uh, actual exhaust velocity is not enough. So, so far, uh, I focused on the uh, exhaust velocity to express thrust. So, however, it's not enough. So in actual thrust, there are a lot of forms types. So for example, first example is a pressure thrust. Uh, the second time is called pressure thrust. And uh, if uh, propellant stream has two velocity component, UE1 and UE2, the total thrust will become like this. So this thrust cannot be expressed by using single exhaust velocity. So in this case, uh, how should we treat the exhaust velocity? Uh, sorry, I'll skip this. Uh, so the answer is very simple. So let's redefine the exhaust velocity as effective exhaust velocity. The definition is a thrust divided by M dot. The address with the form, actual form of the thrust, total thrust divided by m dot. This is a definition of effective exhaust velocity. By using this definition, uh, we can use uh, the rocket equation, uh, which was introduced in the previous slide. So uh, this she like effective exhaust velocity is not actual flow velocity. It's a uh, velocity defined by this equation. And also as a final part of the fundamental, uh, I'll introduce a very major and important quantity, specific impulse. It's very famous uh, index for propulsion system, especially it's expressed a uh, few efficiency of the system. And the definition is almost same as exhaust velocity. Just a difference is this G. So exhaust velocity, effective exhaust velocity is definition was F by M dot. But the definition of a specific impulse is F by M dot G. So in that sense, uh, the value of specific impulse and exhaust velocity is just uh, 10 times the difference. Right. So in the case of exhaust velocity, four kilometers per second, ISP, Specific impulse is almost 400 seconds. So uh, both values are easily converted to each other. Okay, uh, I finished the fundamental chapter. Do you have any question or comments? Can you use a comment screen? I have not seen any question or comments, uh, just one graph. <laughs> so Please test that uh, comment screen. Uh, and if you cannot use that one, uh, please say something uh, by Zoom chat to a direct comment. Are you okay? Uh, I have posted the link.
uh, Kazumi uh, Sensei. So uh, I'll just put through a, uh, a test for us now, but uh, I'd encourage everyone, please uh, post your questions and your comments uh, in that link. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's go. So the second chapter is a uh, chemical proportion. So chemical proportion, uh, it's a final goal. Oh, by using effective velocity. Thank you for the comment, but uh, sorry, on the display, too long uh, comment cannot be uh, yeah, reflected, so it's abbreviated. So later I, look at, I can check it. And context, thank you. So final goal is a kinetic energy, kinetic energy, and the start point is chemical energy. Here, but in the middle stage there is a thermal energy. So by using combustion, we usually convert chemical energy to the thermal energy. And the next step from thermal to kinetic, we use rocket nozzle. Is there another definition of maybe uh, exhaust velocity? Mm. I think when you say effective exhaust velocity, it's a basic definition, I think. So uh, when you conduct an experiment, it's not so difficult to obtain the exhaust velocity if you can measure the thrust and the mass flow rate. You don't need to see the detail of the flow to position or divergence or composition, you don't need to check it. You just thrust and mass flow rate is enough to get the most velocity. And this rocket nozzle is a, a tool to convert thermal energy to kinetic energy. And this is a very important point of chemical propulsion. So I will explain about this uh, later. Okay, so this is a basic concept of chemical propulsion system. There are several Japanese, but it's a translation from the English, so uh, don't uh, care. So uh, what you need is a fuel and oxidizer for combustion, and space for combustion, combustion chamber, and this part is a rocket nozzle. This is a, a basic element of chemical propulsion system. So first, uh, rest is a rocket nozzle. So this slide shows a more uh, simplest uh, model of the rocket nozzle by quasi 1D uh, modeling. So here, density, velocity, pressure, and the temperatures are changing along with the uh, stream direction in this slide, X direction. And uh, there are four uh, governing equations, mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation, and the equation of state. So by using uh, these differential equations, uh, we can know the uh, state of profile of velocity or density or pressure or temperatures. In this lecture, uh, I will skip how to solve these uh, equations actually, but uh, I will show you only the result. So if you are interested in the detail inside, please check uh, textbooks. So first one, this is one of the final uh, expression, thrust expressed by throat area and uh, combustion chamber pressure and the thrust coefficient. So AT, throat area. Throat is a narrowest part of the rocket nozzle and that cross section area is AT. And the P0 is a combustion chamber pressure, upstream side pressure. And the CF is a indicator for the rocket nozzle, expressing the performance of the rocket nozzle. And uh, it's determined by the gas component and also uh, aperture ratio. Uh, this is a ratio from the throat to the exit. So how it's expand. And also important parameter is here combustion chamber pressure divided by ambient pressure. So ambient pressure affects the thrust coefficient, if it is. <clears throat> and 
Uh, usually, uh, thrust coefficient is ranging from 1.2 to mm, 1.7, and maybe in the vacuum uh, state, it's which close to the two, so from one to two roughly. And uh, you may see this kind of part, but usually we don't use uh, this kind of part, so we cannot, we don't design uh, such kind of. A, Exhaust mode, uh, rocket nozzle. So thrust coefficient expresses a performance of rocket nozzle. And by selecting the suitable one, uh, you can enhance the stream by 1.5 times or something like that. And the next expression is uh, another expression of thrust by using mass flow rate, sister characteristic velocity, and again, thrust coefficient. This C star, uh, in other words, uh, characteristic uh, velocity uh, is a index for the performance of combustion chamber. And uh, it's affected by combustion temperature and also molecular mass of the gas. So here, R0 is a universal gas constant, and R is a universal gas constant divided by molecular mass. So this graph is a uh, characteristic exhaust velocity dependence on the temperature. So higher temperature, you will get higher uh, C star. Better, it leads to the uh, higher exhaust velocity. And also when you see the molecular weight, uh, lighter molecule uh, is uh, higher velocity, higher exhaust velocity. So when you select uh, gas for chemical propulsion, lighter uh, molecule is mm, superior to heavy one. Okay. And uh, any chemical propulsion system uh, is using that rocket nozzle. And from now, I'll introduce uh, several uh, chemical propulsion thrusters. So first one is a solid motor. Uh, it uses uh, explosive for the combustion. And uh, this is a conceptual view. So here, solid propellant, this is uh, explosive. And the combustion chamber and rocket nozzle. And also for the combustion, you need an igniter. And uh, for solid propellant, uh, there are two types of very famous uh, propellant. One is a double-based propellant. Uh, double base, double means a nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose. So by mixing these two components, we get explosive. This is double based propellant. And the another one, and maybe I think this is more major than uh, previous double based uh, composite propellant. Oxidizer is ammonium perchlorate, perchlorate, uh, ammonium perchlorate, and the fuel is a uh, yes polymer. So a lot of uh, polymers are used. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, here you see the picture. Uh, one typical, uh, so this red one is a composite. There are several other colors, but uh, what I had before was this composite uh, propellant, red color. And double best, double best propellant, uh, this is a black one, this one. And also, important uh, point of the solid propellant is uh, this kind of uh, combustion mechanism. So here, this uh, purple area is a propellant, and the right-hand side is a combustion area. So in combustion area, heat, there is a heat generation. And by heat transfer, this heat is going to the solid propellant and evaporate solid propellant. So gas is ejected here, and these gas these gases are oxidizer and also fuel and mixed. And in, under high temperature, it is combusted and heat generation. So this cycle is repeated inside uh, solid propellant or on the solid propellant surface. And this cycle is largely affected by the pressure. So pressure is a very important index for the solid propellant combustion. 
And also, uh, in this pressure, uh, pressure here, combustion chamber, is determined by the mass balance ejected from the solid propellant, M dot B, M dot burning, and uh, ejected mass from the nozzle, uh, M dot T. So these two mass flow rate, its balance determines the inside pressure. And immediately you find that burning area is a very important uh, parameter. So by changing the solid propellant shape, you can control the uh, combustion pressure. And also you can change the thrust. Okay, next uh, thruster is a liquid engine. So this is a conceptual diagram of liquid engine. So you have a liquid oxidizer and you have a liquid fuel. And combustion chamber and the rocket uh, nozzle. So first, let's see the oxidizer. In the case of a liquid propellant, uh, these are typical uh, oxidizer. Oxygen, nitrogen, uh, peroxide, hydrogen, peroxide, or others. I think these three are mm, quite major. Oxygen is very popular for launch vehicle. And uh, uh, this nitrogen tetroxide, tetroxide or NTO is very major for uh, satellite uh, propulsion system, not launch vehicle. And uh, here, this is a fuel. So hydrogen, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and hydrocarbon based fuel, kerosene or hydrazine. So uh, for launch vehicle, this hydrogen and hydrocarbon-based fuels are popular. Uh, for example, so famous SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 uh, launch vehicle, it's using hydrocarbon-based fuel. Well, uh, hmm, retired uh, launch vehicle, Space Shuttle, uh, it utilizes the hydrogen and oxygen combination. So in the point of the performance, Oxygen and hydrogen is the best uh, combination. However, uh, to utilize the hydrogen, you need to reduce the temperature so much. You need 20 Kelvin, very low temperature. So in the storage capability, it's not so good. So in that sense, uh, several launch vehicles selected uh, hydrocarbon-based fuel. And also uh, for satellite uh, thruster, satellite propulsion system. Oxygen is also not so good. So we need a cryo system, low temperature system, 90 Kelvin. So usually NTO is uh, used for satellite uh, space propulsion system. So depending on the mission and the situation, uh, best propulsion combination is different. Uh, so this is a table for the uh, standard uh, typical chemical propulsion system utilized for space probes, Cape Colombo, Hayabusa, Masgova, Sapir, and Galileo, and others. So you see uh, there are a lot of uh, hydrogen and N2O4 combination. MMH is uh, mm, another type of hydrogen, so very uh, similar uh, fuel. Okay, so next let's focus on this part. So oxidizer and the fuel, they are liquid. And here we make combustion. And for that, we need to inject oxidizer and fuel into combustion chamber. It's obvious, but not so easy. So here, combustion chamber, pressure is very high. Typically, mm, 10 megapascal or something like that. And to inject liquid inside that, we need higher pressure than this value. So ultra high pressure we need for this injection. So this injection is not so easy. And how we get uh, that method? First one, maybe the simplest one is here, blow down system. So let's prepare two tanks for fuel and oxidizer and uh, fill gas here. But this uh, gas pressure is very high, high pressure gas inside tank. Then this gas, can push liquid into the combustion chamber. So this gas should be 
uh, this gas pressure is, should be higher than the combustion pressure. So the disadvantage of this system is, so gas, this gas pressure is very high. So we need a very tough tank for this oxidizer and fuel. So tank must becomes very heavy. And also you will immediately understand that by consuming the oxidizer and fuel, the volume of gas is expanding and the pressure is changing. It means mass flow rate is changing. So it's not so good. And the second method, a little bit sophisticated method is a pressure regulator system. By using a pressure regulator, this is very common device for in experimental room. So if you enter in any kind of experimental room, maybe you can see this kind of pressure regulator on the top of the high pressure bomb, high pressure tank. So this is a system to regulate the pressure from high pressure to low pressure. So by using this pressure regulator, uh, you can get constant uh, pressure here. So you can keep uh, the mass flow rate constant. However, still you need very heavy tank for this fuel and oxidizer. So usually, especially for launch vehicle, uh, we use this kind of system, turbofoil. This is a combination of turbine and pump. So by using the turbine power, uh, we rotate uh, pump, we operate pump. Then we pressurize the liquid propellant. So this star pump uh, is used like this uh, by engine cycle system. So here tar, uh, tar pump is this one and this one. This is called tar pump. Combination of pump and turbine. So first, tiny fraction of fuel and oxidizer is uh, sent to gas generator, very small combustion chamber. And here we combust these two gases and get high pressure, high temperature gas. And by using it, we rotate turbine, this one and this one. Then we rotate pump. So uh, in this pass, uh, fuel is pressurized and the pressurized fuel is sent to the combustion chamber. And in this, by this pass, uh, oxidizer is sent to the combustion chamber. So this is a, uh, usually, for launch vehicle, we use this kind of engine cycle. And the next is another uh, propellant uh, propulsion system, uh, monopropellant cluster. So it's a one type of uh, uh, liquid engine, but uh, especially it's called as uh, monopropellant cluster. So it uses only single propellant, not two propellants, not fuel and oxidizer. In monopropellant thruster, uh, we are using a slightly unstable chemical that decomposes thymicrole by using catalyst. So here you see catalyst and the single liquid. So this unstable chemical will be sent to the catalyst, then combustion occur by itself by using hydrogen or hydrogen power oxide. Then uh, we get combustion. So this is a simpler uh, thruster than bipropellant uh, to liquid thruster. And also there's another type of very simple thruster, maybe the simplest thruster. It's called cold gas jet thruster. The system is very simple. Gas tank, valve, no, it's all, no combustion, no mm, complicated mechanism. Very simple. So in the point of performance, cold gas thruster is very poor. For example, uh, specific impulse of xenon cold gas thruster, which was developed in my laboratory, specific impulse is 24 seconds. This value is very, very low value. However, you see uh, it's very, very compact and uh, its uh, structure is very simple. It means uh, very high reliability. So for a performance, but reliability and simplicity and compactness are very nice. So maybe for micro system, this cold gas jet thruster 
could be one of the um, strong candidates. Do you do? Yeah, you see, you, we can develop a very small one for microcircular system. Okay, next, let's move to the electric propulsion. So, uh, electric propulsion and chemical propulsion, difference is mainly the energy source. But uh, mm, before explaining that, uh, please let me explain the cause of exhaust velocity limitation of chemical propulsion. So when you use a chemical propulsion, usually exhaust velocity is limited by um, five kilometers per second or something like that. <coughs> so uh, this is just an example, very simplified example. When you combust hydrogen and oxygen, for example, let's assume that 18 gram. The energy that you can get will be 24, uh, 240 kJ by one more. So this mass, uh, sorry, uh, please neglect this dot, uh, just mass. This mass is uh, this 18 gram, and this energy is 24 kJ. Then maximum velocity will be determined. If we all we all convert this energy to the kinetic energy, this would be the limit. So actual combustion is not so simple. Generated uh, product is not only H2O, OH, H2O2, uh, H3O, or something like that. There are a lot of composition. And also energy is uh, not used to only kinetic energy. Uh, several energy is used to the uh, temperature increase. So it's, this is an extremely simplified case, but from this case, you can uh, understand there is a limitation for this kind of system. So in the case of electric propulsion, energy and the propellant is divided, the same. So in the case of chemical propulsion, energy source and propellant are the same. This is a main reason of the velocity limitation. However, in the case of electric propulsion, mm. energy and propellant are uh, independently prepared. Then we mix those by any uh, fraction. Then, so uh, we can control, adjust uh, velocity. In other words, no velocity limit. This is a feature of electric propulsion. So yeah, I say that by using electric propulsion, exhaust velocity can be increased anyway uh, to any value. But uh, electric propulsion, it's not a perfect, it's not an all-rounder. Uh, one feature is uh, generally small thrust and long operation time we need for electric propulsion. So let's see this mechanism. So uh, basis is very uh, simple. Mm. Uh, let's imagine the energy conservation. So here is available power. Let's imagine solar ray power, panel power, P, 10 kilowatt, one kilowatt, something like that. And the energy conversion efficiencies. So this is efficiency. So maximum value is of course one. And uh, some part of this P is converted to the kinetic energy. So this is the uh, relation. And here, uh, please remind the relation between force and um, exhaust velocity. F was, uh, is equal to M dot times E, exhaust velocity. So by substituting this relation into the right-hand side, you will get this term. So here you see, under the constant power, when you increase the exhaust velocity here, this force should be decreased to keep this energy conservation. Uh, conservation. So this is the basic nature of the low thrust of electric propulsion under limited electrical power. And power is, of course, it always limited. So another aspect is here. So let's uh, multiply operating time here, T. And uh, T. And uh, 
here I uh, used the uh, momentum relation, Ft, this is inverse. And this is plus to mass, is it, its momentum increases like this. So here I neglect this uh, mass change of spacecraft. In the case, uh, when you use the L2 version, usually mass propellant mass is not so high. So uh, this is not so bad uh, assumption. So for the simplicity, I used to this relation. So in this case, uh, right hand side, uh, uh, you see this expression. So delta V is determined by the mission and the spacecraft mass is also determined by the mission. And uh, U E is exhaust velocity, which uh, you wanna increase. So this means if you increase uh, U E under a constant power, you need to increase uh, operating time. Yeah, it's obvious that increasing the exhaust velocity means increasing the total power input to the propellant. So uh, to increase uh, total energy, you need to increase the time to generate power. So this is a cause of the increase of long operating time by using electric propulsion. So this is a frequently asked question. High exhaust velocity is better? I say that this is not yes. The answer should be no. The reason is if the available power is limited, the operating time is too long. So I will show you one example. So this is a simple example. So let's assume uh, delta B, uh, 13 kilometer, uh, kilometers per second and the payload was well, spacecraft mass one ton, uh, generating power for additive propulsion 10 kilowatt. And uh, by using uh, this uh, rocket equation, you can immediately obtain mass propellant mass for this system. And also for this system, let first, uh, let's assume very, very high exhaust velocity, 1000 kilometers per second. Typical electric propulsion have a 30 kilometers per second. Typical chemical propulsion system has four kilometers per second. So in that sense, 1000 is very high value. But maybe propellant mass will be drastically reduced. So maybe good. So let's see the result. So from these equations, uh, you can obtain other parameters. So first one is already shown energy conservation. Uh, payload mass, spacecraft mass, uh, and delta V and UE are already given. P is also already given. So from this equation, you will determine operating time here tau. And from the second equation, tau is already given power U and here tau. So you can obtain the thrust. And from the thrust UE, you will get M dot mass flow rate. And uh, from M dot to et tau, you will get uh, finally uh, propellant mass. So you can uh, obtain all of the parameters. And this is the result. If payload is a ten, uh, one ton, uh, power is 10 kilowatt, exhaust velocity, fantastic, 1000 kilometers per second, then thrust would be 10 millimeter. M dot is, uh, mass flow rate is a 10 microgram per second. And uh, yeah, MEP, this is propellant. It's just 13 kilogram against one ton uh, satellite. This is very nice, 13 kilogram. However, operating time should become 40 years. Very long. <laughs> so mm, this is not so good. So uh, high exhaust velocity is not always good. And another reason is here, the same question. So what happens if you can increase the power, which can be generated in space? So by increasing the solar light panel, you can increase the uh, generating power. So let's see the, that case. So same condition, one ton and 1,000 kilometers per second exhaust velocity. And here, I increase the power up to 300 kilowatt. So space station 
an uh, international space station is generating roughly 100 kilowatts, so three times. In this case, thrust becomes like this, like this, like this. So propellant is all uh, again very lightweight. It's nice, and also tau is also very not so long, 1.4 year. I think it's a mm, feasible value. However, what is not feasible is the weight of solar array panel. So usually by one kilogram solar array panel, we can generate 30 to 40 watt. So this means 100 kilowatt and three ton. And in the case of 300 kilowatt, you need almost 10 ton. 10,000 kilogram solar panel mass. So by using a very high exhaust velocity, you decrease the propellant mass. Instead of that, solar panel mass is drastically increased. So nonsense, nonsense. So uh, not always uh, chase the highest exhaust velocity. There is a suitable value depending on the mission. And please select such kind of uh, exhaust velocity. Okay, uh, then next, uh, move to the out of uh, type of electric propulsion thrusters. So first, electric propulsion, it's cut, uh, it's a thruster, they are, it's a thruster uh, categorized into three types. Electrothermal acceleration and electrostatic acceleration and electromagnetic acceleration. So this electrothermal acceleration is very simple, but uh, by using dual heating, electrical energy is converted to the thermal energy. And by using rocket nozzle, it's converted to the kinetic kinetic energy. So the latter part, this part is the same as a chemical propulsion. So electrical energy is used, just used to do the, uh, for warming up the gas. And the second method, electrostatic uh, acceleration. Uh, this it's directly converting the electrical energy to kinetic energy by using electrostatic force. Hmm. And the third method is electromagnetic acceleration. This is uh, also directly converting the electrical energy to kinetic energy. So electrothermal, electrostatic, And okay. so uh, uh, there are a lot of types of uh, thrusters: ratio depth, arc jet, gritted iron, hole effect. Mm. And later, I will explain each thruster. And uh, in this slide, uh, you will see the typical exhaust velocity for uh, each thruster. So for example, um, object thruster, uh, its suitable exhaust velocity is around eight kilometers per second. In the case of a gridded ion thruster, or simply ion thruster, its value is around 30 kilometers per second. So this is a typical exhaust uh, velocities, depending on the thruster type. And uh, let's see the detail of each thruster. First one is a ratio F thruster. This is very simple. By using resistor, increase the uh, temperature of the gas, then eject. So instead of cold gas, it's using hot gas. So maybe you can say it as a hot gas jet thruster. Very simple and uh, easy to develop, I think. So, Mm, but exhaust velocity is limited to around one to five kilometers per second, not so high. Uh, and you use a hydrogen, mm, you can attain very high, uh, maybe eight kilometers per second uh, exhaust velocity, but uh, uh, hydrogen, it's very difficult to storage, uh, to store in space. So it's easily escaping from the tank. So very difficult problem. But anyway, uh, this is a very simple, ready to thruster. 
And the second one is arc jet thruster. This is also electrothermal type. So it's increasing the temperature of gas. But method is different. It, use, it uses plasma to uh, warm up the gas. So here, electrode. Usually, this part is cathode, and the outer part is anode. And between cathode and anode, there's arc discharge. And gas is penetrating that arc discharge, and uh, temperature is increased. So in this case, uh, more efficient uh, heat exchange uh, we get. Then um, exhaust velocity is higher than the previous one, register clusters. And the next one is a gridded ion cluster. Uh, this would be the one of the most successful uh, electric propulsion cluster. And uh, inside is a little bit complicated. Uh, first, we need to create plasma here. And uh, for that, we need gas and power. Then we create plasma. Plasma is a um, mixture of ion, electron, and neutral particles. And by increasing the temperature of the gas, we get this kind of plasma. And by using a grid system, electrode, uh, we accelerate only ions to outside. In this slide, these blue particles, they are all, uh, only, uh, only these ion particles accelerate to outside. And uh, if you emit only ions, uh, this means electron remains inside the satellite and the uh, satellite charge will be decreased. So to avoid it, we need neutral uh, electron emitter here. It's called as neutralizer. So it's emit electrons. Then uh, keep the charge of the satellite constant. So this is a set, ion thruster. And the four effect cluster, uh, inside is a little bit difficult uh, to explain. So here I'll skip, but its a feature is this donut-like plasma. So in annular gap, uh, plasma is created and ions are accelerated by electrostatic force. So in the point of acceleration, it's very similar with the uh, ion cluster. But the uh, one mm, difference is for a thruster, it's mm, more suitable for high power usage or high thrust usage rather than uh, ion thruster. And the next one is a field emission uh, electric propulsion. Uh, sometimes it's called as uh, wait. field emission electric propulsion. So usually we simply say it FIP. So FIP, uh, it's an electrostatic type propulsion system, but it does not use plasma. Uh, it directly extract ion from liquid metal. So by using this kind of uh, structure and very high voltage, 10 kilovolt by one millimeter and very sharp edge, uh, ions are extracted by very strong electric field. So, and these ions are accelerated to our side. And the similar thruster is here, electrospray thruster. Only the difference is uh, here, uh, instead of liquid metal, here ionic liquid was used, is used. And also ejected particles are sometimes ion, but sometimes the charged droplets are ejected. Operation is very similar with the uh, previous FIP, but the uh, propellant is a little bit different. And uh, mass of the uh, ions or droplets are different. And the uh, final thruster is a pulse plasma thruster. This is an electromagnetic type. So here you see capacitor, large capacitor. Uh, this capacitor is charged up to one or two kilovolt high voltage, but not so high as uh, FIP. 
lower than the feet and electrical spray. And uh, here there is a two electrode. So one strong feature of this thruster is propellant, PTFE. In other words, Teflon was used for the propellant usually. So solid propellant, but not explosive. And by using a spark plug, uh, we initiate uh, breakdown. So this breakdown makes uh, plasma inside the electrode and the current starts to flow this room. Uh, shape of the, uh, please wait. It's uh, how to control the shape of the liquid of feet. Ah, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, difficult. <laughs> so, damn it. So this is my uh, drawing, but actual drawing is like this. So here there is a solid needle and the rigid metal is how to say, uh, is wet on the solid needle. And uh, as a very tip of this uh, needle, uh, rigid is deformed by electric uh, electric field and its surface shape is deformed and naturally this kind of very sharp edge is uh, uh, shape hold. So it's not so easy to control the this shape. So not too strong electric field, not too low electric field. We need to uh, change the uh, needle shape and the uh, strength of electric field. So yeah, by computation, somehow we can uh, predict the shape, but basically empirically, uh, we determine the shape. So I say, uh, I wrote here, telecom instability, uh, this kind of physics is utilized for this uh, very sharp edge uh, tip, okay. Oh, sorry, uh, over. Okay, sorry, uh, uh, please let me move to the final chapter, microcompression. Uh, sorry for that. So, so far I have explained the chemical propulsion and electric propulsion. These are category of propulsion system by the energy source. And the next is micropropulsion. This is another direction of category by size, micro or standard or huge size. In that sense, uh, all of the propulsion system uh, utilized for micro propulsion the same as chemical or chemical electric propulsion. The difference is just the size. But uh, there are some difficulties in miniaturization of the technology and uh, the performance of uh, uh, the performance becomes lower. So it's a uh, nature, uh, unavoidable basically. So uh, if you are a developer or a researcher, uh, how to resist that kind of uh, performance down is a very good challenge. And if you are a developer of the satellite, uh, you need to select the suitable micropropulsion system. All propulsion system, its performance are decreased from the standard size one. And also maturity of the technology is not so high as a standard. So among those thrusters, you need to select. So in this micro propulsion, uh, I have a four uh, small sections. Uh, first, I wanna show you several keywords. And the second is, uh, I will show you the point how to choose uh, micro propulsion, suitable micro propulsion. And the third is, uh, uh, recent torrent. And uh, finally, I pick uh, up a few uh, propulsion system as my recommendation. Okay, first one, uh, three keywords I have. Uh, 
and the first keyword is a uh, different roles. So when you say propulsion system, um, and when you think about uh, choosing propulsion system, you may think uh, about what is the best propulsion system or something like that. But uh, in the world, there is no such kind of propulsion system. So the role is different and the suitable propulsion system would be different. So for example, orbit transfer and drug compensation for these, for these high specific impulse uh, propulsion system would be suitable. And in the case of unloading or unable, multi-active thrust, it means uh, there are a lot of thrust ahead would be suitable. And also prior to insertion or from escaping from the planet or landing or emergent uh, agent uh, maneuvering. In this case, high thrust uh, is uh, most important. So depending on your mission, please select the propulsion system. So there is no perfect propulsion system. So depending on the mission, uh, best one is different. And the second keyword is a unified propulsion. So in microsatellites, size, weight, limitations are so severe. So uh, unified propulsion is a very mm, effective uh, concept. So for example, in Procyon, this is our previous uh, microprobe. In this case, we combined ion thruster and cold gas thruster by sharing the propellant. Then we drastically reduce the total mass. And also, this is another uh, uh, 60 CubeSat, which will be fly from in this year, maybe hopefully at the end of this year. In this case, monopropellant and cold gas thruster was combined, were combined by sharing the pressurized gas. So as I said, monopropellant thruster need pressurized gas, and that gas can be also for cold gas thruster. So this is a another unified concept. So by this unified propulsion concept, we can reduce the total mass of the propulsion system. And finally, uh, maybe most importantly, safety is very important keyword for actual development. For example, when you use a pressurized gas, there are a lot of regulations for that. And uh, there would be a lot of safety levels for you uh, for the launch. In the case of a toxic propellant, it's the same. And uh, this kind of um, tasks are very heavy for micro propulsion, micro satellite development. And if possible, we need to avoid. In the case of the big project, there are a huge number of people and uh, people dedicated for these kind of actions. So we can manage it. However, Usually, micro satellite development, not so many people, maybe 10 or 10, 20 or 30 people. So, this kind of uh, regulation management or safety reviews are very difficult. Some, sometimes they become very critical, fatal action. Then, uh, a lot of team try to avoid this kind of uh, tasks. And for that, uh, safe propellant, safe system is a smart uh, solution. So safety is very important. Not only performance, uh, by considering the safety, please select the propulsion system. And currently, uh, fortunately, we have many choices for micropropulsion. However, maybe they are too many. And some are really good thrusters, and some are different from the data set. And some may not work at all, just a concept. So currently we have a lot of candidates. So we you need to uh, choose the best one for you. And uh, how to choose? Well, my recommendation is the uh, amount of information. If they released enough information, you can believe their information, but uh, if, if information is limited, mm, it's very difficult to believe them. So not only performance. So data sheet, the number, mm, all of the thruster has very good number on the data sheet. However, uh, principle, photo, dimensions, those kind of other information are very important. 
so to uh, get all of these information, then uh, decide what is the best one. And also, uh, yeah, measured value, calculated value, or sometimes planned value are written on the data sheet. So please check those kind of things. And also to know the trend, recent trend, uh, checking the conference is a very nice idea. And also to get the information with micro propagation system, conference is very nice. And one, my recommendation is here, small satellite conference. This is uh, one of the biggest conference, small satellite conference. And to check uh, this conference, uh, you may know the recent trend and uh, mm. so it's very convenient. And also this conference, it features a single session presentation. So attendee, the number of attendees are so huge, maybe 3,000 people or something like that. But the presentation, presenter is so, the number of presenters are so limited. It means uh, there is a very severe selection. So if there is a presentation in this conference, I think uh, so so reliable um, trust. So it becomes a good index. And uh, here I want to introduce an example of SSG uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, two years uh, summer of the presentation. Uh, there are these in total uh, nine presentation in these two years uh, as for propulsion uh, system. And uh, three electric propulsion and the two monopropellant thrusters and the two hybrid thruster. Uh, sorry for uh, today, I couldn't explain this hybrid thruster, but it's a one type of chemical propulsion system. Uh, combination of liquid and solid, and cold gas thruster. And when you see the contents, uh, features are like this. Mm. And of course, different ability by different type. For example, electric propulsion, uh, the feature is high delta B maneuvering. And also by this boundary, uh, so First boundary, this one is a boundary of EP and CP, electric or chemical. And inside the chemical, uh, no reaction type and reaction type. So no reaction type is just using uh, pressure energy. So it is gas jet type. So in no reaction type, uh, the feature would be high reliability. And with reaction type, we get uh, higher energy, so it means high thrust. So different ability by different type, obviously. And uh, another different couple of point is uh, every thruster uh, insists their safety, emphasizes their safety, safety, safety. So safety is, is a recent trend, it's different. And also, uh, it's interesting is that when you say safety, its degree is different. So in the case of a green monopropellant thruster, this green, this word is used to, uh, to say uh, safer than hydrazine, previous monopropellant. So here I wrote the composition, and uh, you may imagine that uh, this chemical is not drinkable. <laughs> Maybe touching is not so safe, but better than hydrazine in the point of safety. And also when you see hybrid thruster, ABS, this is polymer, so it's very safe. But the oxygen, mm, pure oxygen is very risky gas. Mm. Of course it's uh, existing air, but uh, if you have a uh, oxygen bomb, bomb uh, tank, uh, you need to uh, take care so much. So in the point of pressurized gas and pure oxygen, it's a risky material. So in that sense, uh, indium, teflon, and water are very safe material, especially teflon and water are very, very safe. Teflon, you see on the fry pan, uh, pan and also water, mm, I don't need to explain, so very safe. So degree of safety is different if they say safety. So please check those kind of actual material. 
And finally, actual final three slides, uh, four slides. Uh, I introduced uh, several of my recommendations as a micropropulsion system. First one is a very famous Marco propulsion system. It was used for Marco 62 CubeSat. It's a cold gas thruster. So liquid propellant, liquid mm, liquefied gas is uh, installed inside the tank and eight thruster eject these gas. So very simple, not so high uh, performance, but very simple thruster and uh, there's a space heritage in deep space. And also this is FIP developed by Emparsion. So FIP is very nice, uh, especially for high impulse maneuvering. And actually uh, they started to sell their propulsion system and already a lot of heritage in space. So very reliable, I think. And also this is another one, uh, electric propulsion, ion thruster driven by iodine. So usual ion thruster is driven by xenon gas, but the xenon gas is a high pressure gas, so not so safe. In the, mm. But uh, iodine is a solid at room temperature and very high dense. So it's very nice for micro propulsion. So they are increasing the temperature of iodine, then evaporate it and utilize as a propellant of ion plus. And uh, this is the uh, final one, uh, water unified propulsion. Uh, this was developed by Pale Blue. Uh, this is a skin of company from the University of Tokyo uh, from our laboratory. So in our laboratory, now we are using a water propellant for a lot of micro propulsion systems. And, uh, this is a combination of the ion thruster and the resistive thruster. So high impulse and uh, small thruster head uh, thrusters. So in the point of the uh, specific impulse or exhaust velocity, this water ion thruster is not so high as FIP or uh, iodine ion thruster, but uh, it can be combined with the water resistive thruster. So there are five thruster heads for resistive thrusters and one ion thruster. So, and also the propellant is water, so extremely safe propellant. So performance is not the highest. However, in the point of the balance, safety, large axis, and high specific impulse, it's very balanced uh, propulsion system, I think. Okay. Uh, so this brings the end of my presentation. Uh, sorry for my uh, over time. Thank you for hearing. Thank you very much, Kazumi Sensei. That uh, that was a fantastic presentation. It's very very detailed. Uh, we do have time uh, for a few questions. Yeah. Um, and we've had one um, actually. Before I ask these questions, I, I might just ask if we can uh, try and um, move through as many as possible. So if you could keep your uh, answers brief, that would be good. Um, but the first one was from uh, Yasu who asks, what are your, your thoughts on launching two different missions with two distinct spacecrafts attached together initially and using one another as the propulsion system in the opposite direction during separation to achieve two respective trajectories? For example, one that goes into some planet's sphere of influence and one that just keeps aiming for a deeper space trajectory. Uh, is that question written in the chat? Or? It is, but it's it's quite a way up in the chat. Um, I'll just repost it just one moment. Then that way you can uh... read it. Here we go. Uh, that was from Yasu, so I just posted it in chat for you now. So does it mean... Mm, so I think what Yasu is proposing is that there are two, uh, two spacecrafts mm. uh, attached together, launched together initially, yeah, yeah. and then they separate after launch um, and use uh, the, so the separation as uh, yeah. part of the propulsion system in order to move them into two different tra trajectories. Yeah, very complicated. <laughs> as principle, yeah, it yeah it can be used as a propulsion system. Yeah, by the principle, yeah, by reaction force, there is acceleration, but uh, the degree of acceleration is too low basically. 
So by using the spring or any kind of the separation system, maybe the separation speed is a, a few meters per second or 10 meters per second, that range, not one kilometers per second. Yeah. So usually to use as a effective propulsion system, we need uh, some, at the minimum maybe 100 meters per second or something like that we need. So usual separation system uh, is not so high. So you need a special technique. So yeah. one idea is a rotation. So I have here had one idea about uh, this kind of, a, yeah, by rotation. So these two spacecraft, at the first increasing the rotation speed and the increase increase the rotation speed. So there are a lot of centrifugal force. And at a certain time, cut the wire and maybe, <laughs> but uh, by using this system, mm, uh, Attainable velocity is uh, limited, so it's uh, mm, difficult. Mm, but uh, I see mm, it works somehow. <laughs> so it's depending on the mm, degree of the velocity. Thank you very much for your thoughts, and that was an interesting question. I I, I thought. Um, but yeah, I can see yeah, your point. Yeah. Um, we had a question from uh, Ishet who asks, um, what recommended uh, systems would you, uh, well, what systems would you recommend rather for small satellites in LEO? Yeah, it's uh, depending on the mission. Mm. Uh, air drag compensation, orbit transfer, uh, mm, rendezvous. So, mm. yeah, it's a, it's a little bit difficult to uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. answer, so, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, Isha also asks about um, for beginners, um, where should they start if they're looking at uh, designing a propulsion system? Mm, yeah, first, please. Uh, consider the mission and the role of the propulsion system. For what do you use that propulsion system? So as I said, there is no perfect propulsion system, all around the propulsion system. So uh, depending on the mission, you need to change the propulsion system. Yeah, understood. Um, Christian actually asks um, about the use of water. Um, He's asking why has water uh, unified propulsion uh, not been used uh, more or before? Um, uh, is it because of low mass impulse rate? Yeah, simply due to the uh, safety at the density. And also I wanna add uh, uh, another feature that is in situ resource utilization. So maybe 20 years later, we can get water on the moon or Mars. Right. Mm. But uh, yeah, getting another propellant on Mars and the moon is very difficult. Iodine or uh, <laughs> hydrogen, not so easy. So mm. best uh, in space resource would be uh, water. So in that sense, I'm, I like water. <laughs> Yeah, so if you're doing a deep space mission, it becomes yeah. uh, very valuable when you can mine uh, you know, what you need to be able to produce the fuel on the moon, let's say, um, the, the cost of doing so would be greatly reduced compared to actually yeah, yeah, trying sure. to, to, to send fuel from Earth. Um, yeah, it's a good driver. Um, I actually also wanted to ask you um, what your thoughts are on uh, ethanol-based uh, green propellants. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the uh, good ideas. But uh, the point is, uh, what is the oxidizer mm, for that? So yeah, I see. Oxygen is a very nice oxidizer, but uh, um, storage capability is not so high. So we need another one. Mm, we, need, uh, we need to find a good oxidizer, yeah. Mm, okay, all right, well, thank you very much. I think uh, we probably have run out of time uh, in terms of uh, Q&A, uh, but please everybody uh, join me in uh, thanking Professor Kazumi for his time uh, this evening.
and for such a detailed, um, well put together uh, presentation. We will be uploading a copy of the video of the presentation as well as his presentation slides um, and resources for you to use shortly. Um, but the next lecture in our series will be held on the 1st of March. I'll very quickly just share my screen with you. So just uh, bear with me one moment. Uh, I just want to go through and give you a quick update on uh, the next dates. So uh, this is very uh, uh, familiar to you now. These are the common dates or the important dates uh, for the Mix 7 uh, competition. So please, if you haven't already, take note of them. Um, I will just skip through to this screen, which is probably something you're all very interested in. This is the evaluation criteria. This is how your submission will be evaluated. So we've broken it into four categories of originality, impact, engineering, and feasibility. And uh, the basis points for each one is listed in brackets there. So please consider all of these uh, elements when you are designing uh, your mission idea. Uh, and so with the conclusion of Professor Kazumi's lecture, we have two more to go. Uh, the next one, as I mentioned, is on um, the 1st of March, uh, and that is Professor Ozaki. And his lecture will be on the trajectory design for deep space exploration missions, uh, which is um, a logical next step after talking about propulsion. So please make sure you uh, set the date uh, in your calendar and join us for that one as well. If you haven't already, just a reminder once again to please download the abstract, abstract template uh, and start thinking about your abstract. We uh, know that there's a lot of time before the submission is due, uh, but time will go very quickly. So start thinking about it now. And just once again, I'd like to extend uh, our thanks to you for joining and attending the session today and to Professor Kazumi for his valuable time.